everyone. Welcome. Um, aloha kako. Uh, my name is Miley Arvin, and I am co-director of Pacific Island Studies here at the University of Utah. It's my great pleasure to welcome you to our spring symposium series. I am speaking to you from my home in Salt Lake City. Um, and for those of you who may be only listening instead of viewing the screen, I am a light-skinned Native Hawaiian woman with dark hair in my 30s. And I have one of those nifty Zoom background images. Um, and my image shows an aerial photo of the Salt Lake Valley with some buildings of the University of Utah campus visible in the foreground and the Wasatch Mountains in the background. Um, we also have this border of a red Pacifica pattern block U logo that represents our Pacific Island Studies program. And really this image of the beautiful land here reminds me to begin by sharing the indigenous land acknowledgement written for the University of Utah. We acknowledge that this land, which is named for the Ute tribe, is the traditional and ancestral homeland of the Shoshone, Paiute, Ghostute, and Ute tribes. The University of Utah recognizes and respects the enduring relationship that exists between many indigenous peoples and their traditional homelands. We respect the sovereign relationship between tribes, states, and the federal government. And we affirm the University of Utah's commitment to a partnership with native nations and urban Indian communities through research, education, and community outreach activities. So I hope our words here today, though focused on Pacific Islanders, remain in good relation with the Ute, Shoshone, Paiute, and Goshute peoples. Thank you to Dean Catherine Stockton for her support, as well as our funders, the Mellon Foundation, the University of Utah's Global Learning Across the Disciplines grant from the Office of Global Engagement. This series, Pedagogies for Indigeneity and Diaspora, Pacific Studies at Home and Abroad, brings together a number of teachers, activists, and community leaders to talk about what it means to teach Pacific Studies in the current moment. In the pandemic field shift to online teaching and conferencing, what are the pedagogies both old and new that Pacific Islander scholars, activists, teachers, and performers are drawing on to educate and foster knowledge relevant to Pacific Islander people? This panel is the third of four panels, uh, two of which happened yesterday, and the last of which will happen at 3 p.m. today. And these conversations also follow from a launch panel on March 18th. Throughout the symposium, we take special inspiration from the work of the late scholar and poet Teresia Tewa. Her work, which so creatively transgressed disciplinary boundaries, continues to offer a vibrant model of teaching Pacific studies at home and abroad. The title of the panel today, The Classroom as a Metaphorical Canoe, like the titles of all the panels in the symposium, are quotes from her work. Within the broad topic of Pacific Island Studies, Pedagogies for Indigeneity and Diaspora, this panel focuses specifically on issues of education. So the structure for the panel will be uh, our moderator will introduce the panelists, and then each of them will have about 10 minutes to present and discuss their work. Then there'll be some time for the panelists to dialogue amongst themselves before opening it up to questions from the audience. Um, please feel free to add questions or comments to the Q&A box during the event. You can find it at the bottom of your Zoom menu screen. Um, and we'll select as many as we can within the allotted time for the panelists to answer after their presentations and dialogue. Also, please note we have live captioning available during this event. To enable it on most Zoom platforms, you can look for the CC or closed captioning button um, on the menu of the meeting controls at the bottom of your Zoom screen and simply click on that button to view the captions. Some viewers may also need to select show subtitle after clicking the CC button. Um, and so in the chat now, I think our team will be sharing some links to some related Pacific Islander programs and opportunities, um, just so folks have them. And I'll also say a bit more about those at the end of the panel. Um, and with that, um, it's my pleasure to introduce to you the moderator for today's panel, Dr. K. Halani Vaughn. 
Dr. Kealani Vaughn Kanaka Maui uh, joined the University of Utah in 2018 as an assistant professor of Pacific Island Education in the Department of Education, Culture, and Society and the Pacific Island Studies Initiative. She also serves at the, as the faculty advisor to the Pacifica Bridge Program, a higher education bridge program between the local Pacific Islander community and the U as part of the Mellon Foundation's grant to transform. As a scholar practitioner, Dr. Vaughn's teaching and research interests are in Pacific Island studies, indigenous epistemologies, higher education, and decolonial practices and pedagogies. Her book manuscript, Transindigeneity, the Politics of California, Indian and Native Hawaiian Relations, is about the transindigenous recognitions between Native Hawaiians living in the US and California Indian tribes. An interdisciplinary ethnographic project, Transindigeneity utilizes a Native feminist praxis to forge new methodological, theoretical, and political directions for Indigenous recognition-based politics. Her recent work, Sovereignty Embodiment, a Native Hawaiians and Expression of Diasporic Kuleana, was published in Hulili Journal of, in fall 2019. Uh, and Hulili is a leading journal in the field of Hawaiian studies. Um, so with that, uh, mahalo Dr. Vaughn and I'll turn it over to you. Mahalo Maile for that wonderful and generous introduction. Thank you all for uh, making the time and it's my privilege and honor to welcome our esteemed panelists. And I would like to uh, first begin by acknowledging that there is a protocol that Maile had introduced in terms of acknowledging the living people, um, the indigenous living people whose lands we reside on. And that is the Ute, Goshu, Paiute, and Shoshone peoples. And we do that as part of our protocol as Pacifica people. I'm really honored to moderate today's panel and would like to echo Maile's remarks about the labor that has been done to create this symposium from the faculty, staff, and students. It's been truly a privilege to be in a place that is committed to having these discussions in both theory and praxis. And before I begin introducing our esteemed panelists, I would like to give context to the panel and some of the themes of the overall symposium, which is indigeneity and diaspora, and then in the context of this panel, education. Teresia's work, one in which we are pulling from for our overall conference symposium and our panel, The Classroom as a Metaphorical Canoe, Cooperative Learning in the Pacific Studies, discusses how education can offer us tools for liberation while simultaneously trying to dominate us, which he describes as a colonial paradox. Before we start our panel, I would also like to acknowledge the many lives lost in our community due to COVID and racial state violence, which can be seen as one in the same. I would like to also give some time to recognize someone in particular from the Salt Lake community, Margarita Satini, who was a huge proponent of education, but overall community engaged advocate. So as we navigate the colonial paradoxes, let us be reminded of the genealogy of community advocates and mentors that have created the many spaces that we occupy today. Let me start our talano by introducing our panelists in order of speaking. First, Melcina Falau comes to us from Pingalap, known as the Island of the Colorblind. Her homeland of Pingalap, Otao, is part of the Pompeii Islands archipelago, known as the Pompeii State um, of Micronesia. She holds her heritage and her ethnicity sacred. She occupies multiple roles. She is the mother of four grown up adults and grandmother to the cutest grandson. Her daughter is actually one of my mentees and she's a very loving, brilliant scholar. So if that's any testament to Melcina parenting, um, I can say that. She's also a second grade teacher at Pacific Heritage Academy and is one of the founding teachers at the Unique Charter School. In her spare time, she is involved with her Rose Park neighborhood and her community. She's also a founding and a member and chairwoman of the United Micronesian, Micronesian Women Organization in Utah, a nonprofit 501c3 organization. And the United Micronesian Women Organization was OCA's Asian Pacific Islander American Advocates, Utah's Chapters 2020 Emerging Community of the Year Award. 
and focuses on promoting, empowering, and educating through membership, mentorship, and connection in hopes to better the trajectories of Micronesian girls and women. Melsina is also the co-chair of the United Micronesian Coalition and also co-founded Utah Pompeian Organization. Next, we have Dr. Finalsina Tovo. Tovo is a Tongan American scholar born and raised in East Palo Alto, Bay Area. Um, to Reverend Unisi Tovo of Ma'umfanga, Kalamotua, and Fo'omotu, working in the California Community College System for 10 years, Final Sina coordinated the Mana Pacific Studies Learning Committee, which specializes in college navigation, retention, and transfer success for Pacific Islander students. Final Sina earned her EDD with the completion of her dissertation titled Talanoa Amana, validating Oceania voices in a Pacific Studies Learning Community in May 2020. Congratulations. Dr. Tovel's research has been recognized by the American Education Research Association and the Ministry of Education in Tonga. Currently, Finalsina is the Mana Learning Community Coordinator and a professor in counseling success and Pacific studies at the College of San Mateo. Additionally, she is the coordinator of the California Community College Mana Network, which she consults community colleges who wish to support their su towards NHPI students. Additionally, Dr. Tovel serves uh, on the Pacific Studies Curriculum Planning Committee in the US higher education system, a member of the Tongan Research Association, San Mateo County Pacific Islander Initiative, and a member of the Bay Area Regional Pacific Islander Task Force. She is a proud first generation college graduate of the University of California, Riverside, which I also hail from, San Jose State University and San Francisco State University who puts her scholarship privilege into action to protect Mauna Kea and Black Lives. In collaboration with the Center of Pacific Studies at the University of Hawaii at Manu, Dr. Tovo is a contributing author to the Teaching Oceania series book. Let's welcome Dr. Tovo. Next, we have, but not least, we have Damon Celesa, who is a prize-winning scholar who specializes in the study of colonialism, empire, government, and race with a particular interest in the Pacific Islands. He also works on education, economics, and development in the Pacific region, as well as in New Zealand and Australia. After studying at the University of Auckland, he completed his studies at Oxford University. He is currently an Associate Professor of Pacific Studies at the Center for, of Pacific Studies, University of Auckland. Previously, he was an Associate Professor of History, American Culture, Asian Pacific Islander American Studies at the University of Michigan, Ann Arbor. So I would like to begin um, and we'll turn it over to Melsina. Thank you so much, Kehau and Maile for that nice introduction. Can everyone hear me okay? Yes, we can, thanks. Okay, perfect. Thank you so much for that. And I just want to take you guys through my Pacific Heritage Academy. I call it my just because I've been there since day one. And greet you in my native tongue of Kasele Lia Mainko. And I'm, as an introduction again, I'm not going to say my name, but I am a brown skinned, freckled face, being a piece from Pohnpei Archipelago in the Federal States of Micronesia of uh, Oceania. And I am zooming from my house actually behind me. It's my study. There's bookshelves in the back with books and papers that needs to be corrected. And basically pictures of my family and some memorabilia from their um, grade school level years. I'm wearing a teal shirt with the Pacific Heritage Academy logo on it. I don't know if everybody can see it. And behind me also is my Micronesian, Federal States of Micronesia seal in Opong, which is uh, made out of uh, fibers of coconut, bandanas. And then what I'm wearing with me today is actually just a reminder of who is behind me. And it reminds me of the woman in my life, my sisters, my mothers, and uh, that's referring to our aunts, our grandmothers, our great grand aunts. And my tribe, my woman tribe is Wei, which is basically the turtle. 
And it's just a reminder, a constant daily reminder to me or for me that the turtle, even though it started its life on land, it actually spends the rest of its life in the ocean. And it's the most beautiful, strong, graceful, or one of the most graceful um, beings or creatures of the ocean and land. So that's my tribe of the Micronesian woman. So with that introduction again, I want to take you on to my Pacific Heritage Academy. And if I were uh, with you guys today, I will give you guys a kukui nut, a very famous uh, lay from Hawaii, our host island of Pacific Heritage Academy, which is a charter public school, K-8. And all of us that teachers there, or most of us are licensed um, level two and a higher. It was founded back in 2012 by three Pacific Island women, um, Mali, Malina or Malia Thurman, Leah Whitman, and Ofa Kinikini Moai, that with some family challenges, uh, decided to create a school that will actually help their kids know who they are. And so the space, the place, and the environment called Pacific Heritage was created. And we're located right here in Rose Park, Utah. Uh, let me see if I can share my screen here. And so today I basically will welcome you guys aboard and take you guys through my Pacific Heritage Academy of protocols that we have with my Micronesian Ponpe and optics. And uh, we have a saying in Ponpe called say what? And it translated in English means paddle the canoe or that's the closest um, translation or connotation with that. And it seems simple, but the protocol is really important. And it's say what, say way, say to, say pene, and say luck. And it's just a process and the protocol and the importance of paddling a canoe when you start again, be the year that, uh, there. But when it's synchronized or when you do it together, then that's when the forward motion of a journey occurs. So with that in mind, I want you guys to go ahead and come with me as I introduce you guys with uh, Dr. Teresia Tewa's um, brilliant, um, brilliant woman. And I'm proud to say I'm a Micronesian just because she's one herself. I'm a fan of hers. And so to be part of the space, I really am humbled and honored to be with these amazing panelists today. Uh, the classroom as a metaphorical canoe for us as Pacific Island, um, Pacific Heritage Academy workers it actually has a protocol. And so I'm gonna go through those main protocols that we go on a daily basis as our targets for today. And also just to remind all of us that um, one thing that um, Dr. Teresia always remind me of is to remember that we cannot paint the whole Pacific with just one stroke. And so with that, this is our Pacific Heritage, this is our point of view, and this is how we tweak the research-based ideas from expeditionary learning or EL education into our own very own um, canoe, to, so to speak. So we start our day with an open crew, which is basically greeting each other by name, reading an initiative and a reflection, and then we go on to our Voyager Creed, which I will actually ask you guys to be part of later on. And then we go over a crew habit, you know, what does the Voyager mean? You know, what are the characteristics of that? And then a classroom crew, which is basically the meat of our day. And there's a translation that comes into play where content, process, and product is very important when we um, go through that. And then we come back or circle around to our close crew. And so this is our journey, our daily journey at the Pacific Heritage Academy. And I'm gonna just go ahead and take you guys with a very quick uh, few of this. So with an open crew, uh, this is what it looks like. We come and we greet each other. Uh, with me in my native Kasselelia Mainko, Kasselen means great, Lelia means wherever your journey takes you. And Mainko is the, you know, the important people in your space. And that's really important to keep that in mind because sometimes we are overwhelmed with all these other noises from other people that are not significant. So keep that in mind, or you can greet 
whatever your native tongue. And we have a chartered um, heritage language that teaches the Hawaiians, the Tongans, the Samoan, and Spanish also. Our current director is uh, Sheena Eliza, who hails from uh, Aotearoa. And so we use Kia ora a lot too. And just to begin our uh, crew, our reading is from PHA Mighty Voyager Creed. And what I would ask is, you know, use your senses. What does it look like to you? What does it sound like to you? And what does it um, feels like to you as I read the reading for today? Looking forward, we honor our past to better see our future. And with that in mind, this is our initiative, and it can be simple as the two visuals in front of you. We Are Crew is actually, like I mentioned, an expeditionary learning education um, logo or a hashtag. But as you guys know, you know, we're very, um, we're part of a crew, a canoe crew, can be an airplane crew, but nobody's a passenger. Everybody has a part to make the canoe work. And with Pacific Heritage Academy on your uh, left or my right, we have tweaked it and used our ancestors' way of wayfinding to guide our canoe. A very, not so much metaphorical, but very real way that we want the kids to be aware of, to experience it and see where all these collaboration is to um, takes place into positioning the act, actions that we take on a daily basis. So that can be as simple as our, um, as the crew, the open crew of the day. And then we reflect on that. We reflect on that and that's the open crew. And then we go right into our Voyager Creed, which is a daily recital. We have a, we have a history that when we first started as Pacific Heritage Academy, we used to do the Ikuma Mao, Ikua, which is a Hawaiian uh, chant where, you know, standing together is. And then with the transitions that we've taken over the uh, years, we've um, came up our stayed with what Ofa and Leah and Malia have actually created called the Voyager Creed. And if you guys don't mind, I know I cannot hear you guys, but you guys read with me as I go through the slides that our K-8 students to every morning, the first five minutes of the day. We are voyagers like ancestors of old. We are strong, inventive, and courageous and filled with wonder. Sailing seas of knowledge, we seek understanding and use it with compassion. Looking forward, and here's our reading. Looking forward, we honor the past to better see our future. We will find hope and success in spite of wind and change. With our eyes open to the heavens, fixed on guiding lights, we know ourselves, our space, our time. We will seek, we will find, we will know new horizons. We are mighty voyagers. And that's our um, sort of the mascot or our logo for our school. The picture and the pictures that you've seen are actually from our Pacific Heritage Academy um, student portal, which is collection of pictures from our affiliates, even from Papa Mao, uh, the Wayfinder, and other um, resources that we have at Pacific Heritage. I have a link there that um, you are welcome to see later. This particular picture in front of you is called the Navigator. And it's uh, commissioned and painted and created by Lisette Yamase, which is a, a young Pohnpeian Turkey's uh, girl that lives currently in Hawaii. And so we like to highlight our younger artists and authors of the, what I call the next generation. And then we go right into the crew habits. You know, what does it take to be a navigator that actually matches this navigator? It can be an explorer and it can be, you know, a voyager. So voyager, navigator, and explorer are, you know, synonymous words to each other. So we go over the crew habits, which are six of them. The responsibility, courage, craftsmanship, uh, compassion, collaboration, and perseverance. And we do have a vernacular that we go by, but with the time limitation, I'm not going to go into that. The reason why um, responsibility is highlighted 
just because um, that's the one that we can be um, going over for the week. It's a whole week thing. And responsibility can mean kole uh, kodana. It can mean fationga. Uh, um, or responsibilidad and in uh, Maori takahanga. And those are some of the vernaculars we go into when we study the crew habits or characteristics. And you can think, pair, share it one day or share it out. But the questions are the, um, are the same. Uh, you need to know, or the kids need to know, or the students need to know, what is it that they're learning? What is it that I'm learning? And then why am I learning this? And then how would I know at the end of the lesson or end of the day, how would I know I've learned this? And it basically has a format with two elements, the success criteria and a rubric. Then you, we use um, you know, research-based protocols or strategies uh, for this particular one is the RTTWs, which is basically you read it. I am learning to read the text. I am, you know, I can think about it. I can talk to my partners or my Zoom partners about it. I can do the work or highlight. It has to be a verb word, highlight, or you can, you know, cut it out or you can research it out, whatever it is, it has to be a work, verb word. And then you write about it. And that's part of your reflection. Uh, and then make sure that you go with the um, rubric and the rubric that a very uh, visual, um, how you feel about your work. And then the classroom crew is the meat of our, our day and it's very intentional. It's multi-sensory. Um, the basic ones are, you know, what do you feel, what do you see and what do you hear? Not just the teacher's voice, or your friends' voices, but what's the music you hear in the background? Is it ocean sound? Is it the wind sound? Or whatever it is that you're trying to teach them, create it using multi-sensory. And the format is very basic. You circle up. I have Kumu, Whitney, Annabelle's picture just to show you guys what a circle looks like, our uh, crew circle looks like, and then a hook. It can be an image of a hook or whatever it is that you're trying to teach with a gallery walk, a short video, less than two minutes, and then a short mini lesson where you come into the basics of the, the Common Core state standards and you state where you're getting your information or why, why they're learning it and how would they know it. And then the meat of the day is the content process and product and I do, we do, and you do. And then you circle back into your circle very important to make sure that the kids know these questions. What am I learning today? What, why am I learning this? And then how will I know I've learned it? And then with the, what am I learning? Make sure you have the content from the um, Common Core State Standard and also your vocabulary. And that's when you can get into the vernacular of the Pacific heritage uh, languages. Uh, I, um, this is a pursuit of excellence. Um, Haka, that is one of the processes that Komunifai, our late beloved Komunifai from Tararaka Aotearoa wrote for us. I wish I had the time, but I have this slide. It's on the slide, so you guys are welcome to play it and see the process. And again, use your senses of, you know, what am I hearing or what does it sound like or uh, what does it look like or what should it feel like? And um, the kids actually learned the haka and all these vernaculars through the process of learning this haka from our late Kumunifai Prime. And uh, you can basically use these translation of content process and product in anything, whether you're using an expert within your school or an expert outside of the school that can actually come in example you see in front of you is David Naylor, a composer that basically came, introduced himself in a song and then took our third grade narrative and turned into a libretto and then helped us go through a process that at the end, even though it was a messy process, at the end we were able to do an opera called The Sea Adventure. So it was a fun. So no matter what the topic is or whether you're online, uh, asynchronous or synchronous, uh, keep in mind the content process and product. And I, I was hoping to read you guys this story, but uh, take your time uh, one day and um, 
read this story, um, be brave to share your stories. The stories that I love are the stories I grew up with, stories of land and sea. And the interesting about the land is that all the fauna and flora of the land, which is related to the, the land or the fauna and flora of the sea or vice versa, as the biological uh, evolution likes to uh, state. Um, this picture you see in front of you, like I mentioned, is from one of our young artists. And she created this picture with Papa Mao in, her, um, in mind. Uh, Pia Sama Pia Luk, which is known throughout the Pacific as Papa Ma from Satawaliak. And the sayings that she loves to be a navigator, you have to be fierce. If you have courage, it is because I have faith and knowledge in my ancestors. And with that, I wish I had the time to read to you guys the story of Roko Roke and Mwesi Siar from Tulchuk. And it was uh, it is retold by Lillian Nemes Pilmore and illustrated by like I mentioned this Dad Yamase from uh, Pompeii. But um, when I I would like you guys to challenge yourselves to read into the legends, not only the Polynesians and the Melanesians, but the less well known of the Micronesian. And the wonderful thing about stories is it can be multifaceted. You can use it as your vocabulary of the day or you know, the other's uh, craft or visualization or character or whatever it is that you're teaching the kids, be very intentional on that. And then the close of our uh, day is a closed crew, which is basically a um, reflection and or an assessment of the day. And it looks something like this. An assessment doesn't need to be a big long exam, but just a exit ticket with three, two, one. So example, three things you learned from the presentation or two questions you still have or just one takeaway and then or you can close it with um, reflection with a sentence frame very important now uh, format for english language learners and that's it for my presentation i i so thank you guys for listening and going through with me in our metaphorical classroom with Pacific Heritage Academy, where you have open crew, Voyager Creed, crew habits, classroom crew, and close crew format with We Are Crew. So kalangan karusi, and thank you very much. Thank you, Melsina, for sharing with us. I think um, a lot of higher ed institutions can learn a lot about the pedagogical practices that you shared with us today and how we could also engage our classrooms in very creative ways. So mahalo nui. Um, next, we'll have Dr. Finalsina Tovo. Greetings in my language. Hello to the people of the land. I hail from the territory of the Ohlone tribe, the people of the Ramatush. Hello. Hello to the ancestors who have marked and sacrificed themselves in order for me to be in this space. To the ancestors of education who are here with us today. Konaihelu, Kufanga, Okusmahina.
to all the scholars who are who paved the way before us and who are here today. To low to the ancestors that are no longer with us. Dr. Teresa Teawa, Dr. Ebeli Haofa, and the rest of our scholars who are in spirit with us today. I ask that you please use me as a vessel, as a way for us to remember why we are here, who are we here for, and why we must continue. My talk today is titled Vakatasi, Research, Reimagining a Colonial Space to Talanoa and Tahiva. With the introduction that Dr. Kehalani did for me earlier, I won't go into it even more, but I wanted to just give some context on my, on my uh, title, Makatasi. The Mana Learning Community is a learning community at the College of San Mateo where I work at. Makatasi Pacifica is the name of the, our student organization that was titled and named by the students for their space. So I only think it's very, it is the right thing to do for me to title this Makatasi because it is my students who are the inspiration through this. I wanted to go through my guidance of Talanoa, even though Talanoa isn't supposed to be like this, <laughs> but I wanted to kind of give you a little bit about what I'm gonna be covering in the next 10 minutes. I also wanna acknowledge that I'm only gonna be talking for 10 minutes. And if Angela gave me a little bit more time, I would have given her even more, but you know, I can't do that. So I got only 10 minutes to do this. <laughs> and I felt like being able to show what I'm gonna go through will be a way for you guys to kind of mark things that if you have questions for me later on. Um, the difference between education and knowledge and the process of schooling. The confessions and lessons from, from me from a, a doctor school of education. I'm gonna be talking about the Tava theory of reality. I'm gonna be talking about Dalanoa as a diaspora tool to complete writing assignments. And then lastly, I'm gonna talk about the Pacific study, how Pacific studies move but beyond the academic walls of the classroom. Before I move on with the rest of my conversation, I want us to really think about this. Research and the process of schooling. Research as a definition that I Googled shows that this, it's a systematic, it's a systematic in, in investigation and study of materials and sources in order to establish facts and reach new conclusions. But in our class, Professor Melissa Aliu, she always discusses about us breaking down the entomology of, entomology of words. And I wanted to show it like this, research, re-search. If we're continuing to see things, to search for things, for new um, conclusions, search is to seek and re is to continue, to keep doing it. And so as we continue to re-look Relook, there's going to be new conclusions that will come up. The process of schooling is what I want to use as a for as a way for us to understand the formalization of education. So you can say the process of schooling is education, or the process of schooling is college, or the process of schooling is school, um, or the process of schooling is classrooms. But I really wanted to not use education as a word for this because it's not that definition is not going to be the same for, for Western and for Pacifica. Our theme today is about uh, ter ter Dr. Teresa Teawa's um, uh, uh, article on the canoe as a, a metaphorical, I mean, sorry, the classroom as a metaphorical canoe. And I started to go back into reading the article again, because I also taught it in our class. And I wanted to look at some of the things that I wanted to highlight. And this is something that I wanted to show. The classroom, as we have inherited, is undoubtedly, undoubtedly a colonial space. It is extremely difficult to indigenize the colonial classroom, which moves me into my doctoral uh, journey. 
I graduated last year and I, along me graduating last year, I had to write a dissertation. And in order for me to write a dissertation, I had to research. I had to look at things that I thought that I already knew, but I really didn't. And these are the things that I wanted to show with, with y'all, my community. Because I think sometimes we, we say some stuff, but we don't really know where the foundation of what it means about this colonial spaces or the effects of it or the impacts of Western education. But let me show you some facts. In my research, I, sh I, I looked at the, over the enrollment overall in community colleges has decreased in America. I have a lot of, um, I have a lot of uh, articles and data that I can show you, but I'd rather just have you um, ask me for it afterwards. <laughs> Enrollment for NHBI communities has also decreased drastically as well. A lot of the reasons why that um, the conversations about this talks about is that in 2008, there was a high, a high pitch of like people going back to school. That was during the recession. So the jobs were like plummeting. There was no jobs, so people went back to school naturally. Since 2010, when it hit its peak of enrollment, it, 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 it has not gotten that high yet. So since 2010, it has continuously decreased. And when our people go to school, attend college here in America, and HBI students attend college, we don't stay. Um, I, I drew some articles from New Zealand. I drew some articles from Australia. I drew some articles from here, from, from, from America in four years to show that we may start college, but we don't stay. Why is this significant? Because the reflections of not staying i mean the reflect the reasons of not staying does not reflect on the nhpi students rather it reflects a larger conversation of our education institution so i don't know about y'all but i thought that people used to make it feel like it was our fault that we dropped out of college that we didn't complete college that we didn't finish our homework or whatever right but i started looking at the numbers that it's not just pis y'all it's everybody in america it is an american issue so what does all these things have in common? Brad, the structure of how we process our education, the process of schooling. So I kept that, like diving deep into this conversation of how we as America process the way we formalize, um, formalize um, schooling. This is, um, was taken from a report of NHPI's enrollment in America. Shout out to the FAM, Inoke Haufoka and Lavinia Oluaves with our allies at UCLA for putting this report together, showing um, the, the um, education attainments for our group, NHPI groups, compared to America. Although you can see a little bit of similarities between the population ratio-wise, you also see some that has dropped drastically. Hint, hint, Tongans, hint, hint. And let me remind you what Teresa says in this article. In reality, if the chief or the navigator of the ocean going canoe, process of schooling, is unfit, the lives of his crew are endangered. The life and death e urgency and survival humility that features in pre-colonial Pacific societies is clearly lacking in most of our post-colonial education systems of pedagogy. To me, it means no wonder why we ain't doing well. The education system or the process of schooling here in America wasn't built for us. So of course we're gonna mess up. It's like building a canoe, but like you, you, you get there and there's no canoe. You're just like, oh, uh, do it yourself. Thanks America. I talk a lot of crap about American education, by the way. <laughs> and so in my research, I uh, explored and utilized and embraced so many different theories that we have in play. And one theory that I kept thinking about that I realized that I was already doing um, within the seven years of an amount of program was this concept of time and space. The Tava theory of reality um, central to this theory is the role of ta, time, and va, space, how it plays in the mutual attraction and repulsion and enabling a dance of change where all things in nature, mind, and society stand in an internal process of relations, of cycle and exchange and, re and uh, 
and returns. Uh, basically, what Okusa Mahina was trying to say is that everything happens in reality, dimension of reality, in two things, time and space. Now, try to think about something that you're trying to do that you, that, that you can do without the other. Yeah, you can't. If you can, hit me. I'm, I'm going to show you that you can't. And so when I was doing my research into this concept of education in America, I started finding theories that were kind of maybe addressing what it was, but not so much. We had Aston theories of involvement, which also talked about, um, I got my notes, this is too much of my notes, I got 10 minutes, anyways. Uh, theories of involvement and Tinto's integration model. Theory involvement, Aston talked about how there is a deposit into the space where he highlights environment and then there's an the outcome of the space. So what you put in is what you get. So Aston had the idea that environment conversations needed to happen on campus in order to understand why students weren't completing colleges. Then Tinto came in with his white face. And Tinto came in and said, um, yes, we have to figure out a way for them to adapt. Let me just say adapt, quote unquote, assimilate into this into this space and that they had too much baggage you need to leave all that at home in order for you to to be able to be successful and be able to retain your knowledge and complete college that makes sense for people who don't have any family for people who don't have any spirit or anything that has to do with it but if you really think about it even white people or white faces have families. They have they have lives. They have social emotional issues. They wasn't even going to be able to let that go. So all both of these theories talked about what could be happening or what, what may be happening, but there was no like how to, because basically they're saying you're on your own, Missy. And so Tava Tava theory or Tavaism. It, it allowed me to replace these theories with this process of schooling with the concept that used my history, my lineage, my language, my religion, my family, my kakai, my land, my ocean, to connect what needs to happen in order for us to move forward. One of the tenets of Tavaism is knowledge. And it defines, it, it defines knowledge as an acknowledgement of time and space and va, which is seen through a process of education, knowledge investigation, or a process of education is then used as a practical purpose. So basically thinking about when you have knowledge, you have to investigate this knowledge and you have to apply the knowledge. That's what Tavaism was talking about within ACO or education. In other words, we replaced the word of schooling or the word of education we, I replaced it with ako, the Tongan word for education or knowledge. The process of ako is fostered through cultivated, uh, cultivated through ta and va using humans, humans as a depository of knowledge, therefore the producers of knowledge. So here I am looking at a theories of Aston and Tinto talking about um, pedagogies, they're talking about environment and whatever, whatever, yet not even talking about how we need to value humans who are actually the depository of knowledges. I'm over here again, really amped up. And then when you start thinking about Waco or Pacific uh, education and knowledge, you start thinking about, you don't think about school, you think about church, you think about family, you think about these relationships, you think about your, your home. You don't think about um, social emotional issues like that or, or, or all these concepts that we use here in America to be able to define what education is supposed to be about or Or curriculum is about to be about. If we as humans are the depository of knowledge, then for us to be able to apply it, we have to apply it to together. We have to apply it to each other. This is how I continue to reconceptualize what my classroom is supposed to look like, what education is supposed to look like, what me as an instructor, as an educator, as a servant to my people is supposed to look like. Within the Tavas and tenets, in the knowledge tenets, 
or uh, with the knowledge tenets called is Tawhiva. Tawhiva is to nurture, Tawhi to nurture, Va, space, relationships. Together is a practice of nurturing relationships between nuclear families, Kainas, uh, we could say Nahikolos, like your villages, or the or the Fenua, the country, the village, um, the the kingdom, wherever you are. Thinking about it from like a local a local relationship all the way to a macro, or like a global, your island, the sea of islands. The aim of Tauhiva is to protect and nurture relations. The reason why I have to say this is because going back into what we talk about Rako and what we talk about education and that we're replacing and reimagining the way America looks at education and the way that we practice education, we see this, Tawhiva. Then you start thinking about Teresa Teawa's article about cooperative learning, okay? about trying to talk to your TA, on the other hand, talking to your, to your class. And what I loved about listening or reading Teresa's article again and again and again is how much this is so big, so simple, yet we're looking for something else. We're looking for something else because this, this, this can't be the one. So for my research, as I was continuing to re-see, re-imagine, re-look at the way that I process education in America, I came up with a method that would help me um, tell the white people, basically, let me just say it like that. Tell the people who don't, who, who don't know us is that I had to translate it. And so my method was using Tawanoa and then I also put in mana as a way for me to fuse David Favade's Dalanoa definition with Linda Tuhiwai Smith's research justice concept and then Django Paris's culturally sustaining pedagogy. I put those three together and then I came up with Dalanoa and mana. When I was supposed to implement my study to show the voices of Pacific Islanders in community college, what I was pissed about was like, every time researchers come and use our students, they don't really get a benefit from it. Sure, you get a $20 gift card, but whatever, like that's done. But what you're giving them, your knowledge from your brain is much more worth than that, right? And like to me, no shade on anyone giving people money for that. But with that, I kept thinking my privilege as an educator or as a teacher in accounting position, I mean, in accounting classroom, Mana, I can actually give them a grade for this. I can actually implement this into curriculum. So I used Talanoa as a diaspora tool to complete my writing assignments. Um, what we did was that we put articles together, six or seven articles together. We had the students put into groups. We had them talk about it. We had them tell on, we, we had them write about it. So then they, we came together and we talked through these concepts. We had um, Tongan scholars, Samoan scholars, the Pacific Islander scholars who came in to have conversations about that. Then the students went and wrote about it. Then they submitted it. Then I gave them a grade. It makes sense to me that cooperative learning also helps you with the writing process. Sometimes, oh no, Students don't know how to write. I still don't know how to write. And I'm, I'm sure you can find some uh, grammar up in this. And, and in order for us to show how can we navigate through these Talanoa, we have to be able to find validating tools to be able to do this. Linda, Linda, I'm Linda. Laura Rendon said this. Um, Gloria Lanson Billing said this, Bell Hook said this, all of these scholars here in America continues to say there has to be tools, curriculum, and people in front of your face to tell the students that they can do it. The power of validating tools in the classrooms um, through culturally responsive curriculum and assignments. So basically, you just got to walk the walk, talk the talk, and be everything at the same time. If I was to be in a Western way of doing this, I wouldn't have been able to do it. I would have felt stressed. But as a pacifica, I just treat everyone as family. That makes sense. If someone comes to late class, I bust them out on Facebook. And let me let me just stop. Okay, we're gonna come back to this. <laughs> With that as my theory and my concept is Talanoa and Tahiva. What does that look like? The consequences of this. Talanoa, man, y'all, we got a lot of baggage within ourselves. 
It's not our fault. It's not our parents' fault, but we got a lot of baggage in here. And then we're not able to learn if we got all these things that we got to think about. You thought I know I was allowing our students to do that. They read concepts from Sefa Aina, from, from, from Emma Wolfgang Poliaki, all of these PI folks who look like them and are in these scholarship spaces, talking about our lives, the reason why our parents go to church and give all that money and then no, there's no there, there's no money at home for the bills, <laughs> or you can't get new shoes. <laughs> With this Talanoa, they were able to unpack this. There's nowhere else that they could do that. There's nowhere else that they can have that without the curriculum, without the cooperative learning, without this concept of understanding knowledge and knowledge production and reproduction. For that. When you're able to unpack stuff and when you're able to heal from stuff, that power that comes from that, of you feeling like you got, of you feeling like you got um, this, this, uh, this, 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 this protective gear, right? That you got a protective space, that you feel like you're being seen in your classroom, you're being seen in the, in the, in the, in the campuses. You want to continue to reciprocate this. You want to continue to protect this. How does Vakatasi move? How does Vakatasi move as an academic canoe to the classroom? Is that we become everything for everyone. In that last, this is what I wanted to end with. At the College of San Mateo, our program, our students has become the spirit, the heart of my campus. And you're recording this, and I'm sure CSM's gonna see this, and I don't even care, because they're gonna, they gonna, they, they gonna say, yep, she's right. We have become the spirit. We have become the people that come to when they feel like they're not being seen. Why? Because we continue to try to re-see ourselves, redeposit ourselves, finding this reciprocation. As a person of diaspora, that is what I've learned. Is that I have learned that what, what, what matters the most is that we have to understand that us as a diaspora, we may feel like we don't have a home there or here, like I may not feel like I have a home in Tonga or here in America, but with this conversation, I'm actually the connection between Tonga and America. I am the diaspora, that is my power. I'm gonna end there because I'm sure my time is up. All right. <laughs> Mahalo Nui, Dr. Finosina Tobo. Um, I really just love the way that you gave us so much of your mana'o and your ike. Um, and how you shifted the discourse of failure, right, um, to, of our community, to schools failing us. Schooling is failing us, and it's not on our community. We have the solutions, right, and you provided a lot of those solutions. And I really also love the way that you had talked about the genealogy of mentorship, right, and how there is ways to connect beyond the familial and to create that genealogy of mentorship within academic spaces so that we can nurture and grow together. So mahalo nui um, for sharing all of that with us. And next, I would like to turn it over to Damon Celesa. Mahalo nui suifua, malangi mama. Kia ora everyone, um, I'm Damon Celesa and I just wanted to acknowledge and thank my panel colleagues and the many of you who are listening and watching. Um, I'm here in uh, Auckland, New Zealand, right by the ocean actually, and in the shade of uh, Mangarei in the rohi of Ngāti Whātua. So I acknowledge the mana whenua here um, and thank all the people who have made this possible and the series of wonderful talks that have happened. Um, of course, I changed my mind about what I wanted to speak about, which um, partly uh, just from listening to, to my fellow panelists, I guess, um, and sorry, Miley, I, I've changed also my profile. So I thought I was coming here as a scholar, um, but I also have another role at the university, which has overtaken my scholarly role in many ways, that I'm the pro vice chancellor of Pacific, the only one in the world, essentially a vice president of the university. And I thought given the, the, the questions and the topics are around pedagogy in the diaspora, that uh, this is a, a useful contribution I might be able to make to this conversation, um, partly because as one of the university executives, <clears throat> I've had to be part of our response to COVID. 
And I think we've learned much about um, what we can do, what we can't do, <laughs> um, but also some of the opportunities that, that lie in this moment to improve pedagogy, teaching, curriculum, not just in a classroom setting, but in a system setting. And so I wanted probably to speak to some of that. Now, of course, in New Zealand, we're in a different space. I'm at a very large university. So the University of Auckland is New Zealand's largest by a long way, nearly twice the size of the others. We have 4,000, just under 4,000 Pacific students at the university. Um, this means that you know, it's core business to the university as it's come to realize through the advocacy of myself and others that Pacific students not achieving, not re-enrolling, not feeling welcome is not just a problem for Pacific students when it's at that scale, it's a problem for the entire university. And it's actually a problem for our nation and our community. So politically, funding wise, um, and in terms of will, the University of Auckland has many advantages over many of our institutions elsewhere, um, but it also means it has disadvantages. Our things have to work at scale. They have to work um, and they have to produce results that transform the lives of our communities and, and so on. And so we have, over the course of the last 30 years, had many, many programs that are devoted to improving Pacific achievement, making sure students are welcome, um, trying to address some of the things about us, as uh, Fee Nelsina was saying, that it make studying at a university um, difficult or even impossible for many of our students. And some of these, and perhaps the most obvious place of our failing is our inability to generate, to recruit, to support, to grow Pacific staff. So we're a, we're a city, we're 20% of our population uh, from the Pacific Islands outside of New Zealand. Um, another you know, close to 20% are Māori. And that means that we're a place which is profoundly Pacific and yet our staff don't look like that. So what, we're, what we need to be doing is really addressing that quite sharply. Um, and I'm hopeful that, that we'll get there um, and sooner rather than later. Um, we need staff that look like our students so the university looks like our students. And so without trying, just by getting up um, in the morning, the university is a Pacific place. That's the kind of dream um, for me and my colleagues. I think that is a, the, the kind of possibility around that um, is that you know, we're in a, a moment where many of the core assumptions of university education and its relationship with school education have had to be questioned. And I wanted to talk a little about that. Um, yeah, we're at, a, at the university, we're in a, a key moment because we've got a new vice chancellor, our university president, and we've just developed a new strategic plan. And the strategic plan has Pacific as one of its core, um, core drivers, one of its strategic objectives, um, both in research and in teaching and education, and also in changing the composition of our staff. And these are big things to accomplish at big, nasty places like universities, but we know Although universities are big and nasty, they're also big and beautiful. And I think um, that's, that's been a really critical part of my understanding about possibility in this. You know, I think 10 years ago, I didn't even care about our university strategic plan. Now I'm one of the faces of our strategic plan. And actually what excites me most is that the university is committed to something alongside our strategic plan, which we're calling the Waipapa framework, which is an indigenous framework that rather than taking a five-year um, strategic plan length of time, is actually taking a 50-year length of time. And so the Waipapa framework, which we'll complete later on this year, I think we'll, everyone here would recognize its kind of vision. It involves actually renaming the university. So the university's indigenous name will go from Te Whariwanang or um, Tamaki Makoto to Waipapa Taumatarau, the Waipapa of a hundred mountains. Um, and um, that means why we, we have a Waipapa framework, which is which are the mountains we wish to climb in 50 years. And yeah, at the center of that is a revitalization of Te Reo Māori, the local um, indigenous language. And actually it called the question for many of us and it will call the question about what is the place of Pacific people um, in a context where we're trying to address um, the, the many, many 
um, challenges that colonialism and our history has visited on, on local indigenous people. So you know, we, we know Pacific people are suffering here in Auckland, but we also know that we have our places elsewhere, but also this is our place, but it's someone else's place. And what does that mean? What does our, our practicing of our whanaungatanga, our, our relationships mean when budgets come? Yeah. <laughs> Who has the first go at the budget? We have to speak, um, we have to conduct ourselves in a way that, that has symmetry between the values we profess and the values we enact when we're sitting with our Māori brothers and sisters at the um, budget tables. And that can be quite difficult on the face of it because I think that that puts us into a position where we must endorse um, Te Tiriti or Waitangi, the, the Indigenous struggle for uh, recognition and proper fulfilment of the Treaty of Waitangi, um, as well as staying true to who we are and our journey as a, an Indigenous people from another place who came here on flying and ocean-going canoes. Um, and so I think that's a really critical question. And, and the answer for me is quite simple, which is that um, we have yet to see a place where Māori thrive and Pacific people don't. So if Māori are thriving, I have complete confidence that Pacific people will thrive too. Um, just because I only have um, a couple of minutes left, I did want to point out some very specific things that happened under COVID. Now we know that COVID actually amplified the deep inequalities that people were already experiencing. Um, it just made them worse. We saw some things that have long been in the critical list for me. Um, and I know that in the US it's happened as well, that one of the, the core effects of, of COVID was to push young men out of education, especially young men of color and indigenous young men into the workforce. So already two thirds of our Pacific students on campus are women. Um, young Pacific men are increasingly missing. They're going into low paid work straight after school. Um, so that's true. Young women, of course, have a different problem that they're pushed into unpaid labor in their extended family situations. And often they have a lot strong academic achievement, but are not able to access um, education because of labor they're doing for their families. Um, so what have we been doing, I guess, is the question. Well, one of them was that the digital presented a new way of conceiving of a university. So we actually have had all staff Zooms where we have 5,000 staff at the University of Auckland. So 5,000 staff have been on Zoom <laughs> and they've actually asked for different ways of communicating. They're in webinars, but they actually want to hear their leaders talk about these things. And so it's presented a new line of accountability. Most of our staff care about this. They care about, they believe in the mission of the university. They believe in social justice. Um, you know, and, and so I think what we have empowered, we've unlocked young staff, which are far more diverse than old staff. <laughs> we've unlocked their ability to speak to their leaders. And, and that's opened up a new line of, of expectation and accountability. I think for me, there's a lot in the digital space that, that is filled with risks. So one of the first things we rolled out, we actually had a staff member when we went into lockdown who had a thousand laptops in her garage and she was couriering them out, um, shipping them out to Pacific and Māori students who didn't have laptops with Wi-Fi dongles. Because how can you be digital when you don't have, you're trying to write an essay on your device? You know, we reminded people about good practice, that if you're living, if there's 15 people living in a three bedroom room, you're going to have your mic and your camera, a three bedroom home, you're going to have your mic and your camera off. Um, those sorts of things. And that meant that we positioned ourselves as looking forward in the digital world. And so we were able to secure new resources. And I'll just talk about two of them in 30 seconds. One of them is that we produced Kahu, which is a digital assistant. Now, all of these, we have Māori and Pacific staff in the design and the co-design. Um, kahu is the sign, the symbol of Ngāti Whātua, the mana whenua here. That brings together our learning management system, events, um, social support, everything for a student and runs a calendar. <laughs> Basically, can we deliver, can we support students with the learning skills digitally that they don't have, that we just assume in our students? Um, a second one was, and I was gonna share this, but I won't, but I can send the link. We redesigned the front face of the university that students see online to something called Your World, Your Way. Um, our students 
clicking through that, it actually is bilingual. So it's in Māori and English. They can pick all the, they answer a few questions and it customizes them. So a Pacific student will open up onto a kind of, if you think of animal crossings, looks like animal crossings. Um, and it has the kind of iconic buildings on campus, but a Pacific student will see a Pacific university um, when they click through it, including our beautiful Whale Pacifica at the center of it. And you will be able to experience a online porphyry. So you'll be formally welcomed as you step through by a traditional Māori welcome, which we created a digital version of. And I guess the last one, and I will leave it after this, is that we are also in this most secured funding to run what we're calling ako kakato, which is the Nguyen phrase for holistic learning. And so in my team, I'm actually onboarding um, up to three social workers who will be able to make home visits and support our students. Now, we understand that this is the first time anyone's ever tried this. There's a lot of risk in this if you don't have trained people. Um, but we're partnered with a Pacific health provider. They'll be able to, in different languages, engage with students, deliver. Um, there's a structure to deliver housing, social support, as well as actually support them into the university's systems. So, yeah, I think this is a moment that's incredibly dangerous for our, our communities, but has the possibility that it's freed up some room to innovate by showing just how flawed some of the earlier ways of doing things were. So I'll leave it there. Paftai Lava. Thank you, Damon. Um, thank you for you know, highlighting your leadership role and all the efforts that you're engaged in at the university level and talking about the possibilities, but also how you're reminded that it's very important to be accountable to um, the Maori whose lands um, you're situated on. And it was exciting to hear about the home visits because that's something that we usually only hear about, you know, with um, elementary schools, right? And the importance of continuing to do that to support our Pacifica students when they um, enter university. So I wanna thank you very much. Um, so before we open it up for q and A, I I just wanted to give a moment for you all to respond to one another, um, talk to each other about each other's presentations um, and before we open it up. So um, five minutes for that. If you all just wanna kind of speak to what you all heard from each other or a question to each other. I'm just grateful to be in the same space and same time as Damon and Fina. Very powerful. And I'm trying to be not emotional. So I'm going to shut up right now. So I'll turn the times over to them. No, sis, don't ever uh, not be emotional. We have to be. We're people. Um, I'm. I've been sitting here just really loving both of the conversations that we've been having today. Damon, you know, I don't, I know I've already told you that I'm super um, appreciative of you being in the position that you're in as an educator and a staff member and moving into admin. It's not easy. We have to continue to think about who are we going to be showing up as, you know, and for me, when I see you there, you know, and I see you, when I see you there, it makes me feel like I could be there. And I want people to understand that whoever's on this Zoom webinar right now, if you're thinking about just completing college, sure, you should think about that. But you should think about, we need y'all. We need more educators. We need more of us in these spaces. We need another provost. Damon's the first, but he ain't the last. <laughs> um, and I, you know, these ambitions that I have as a professional is founded through my ambitions of me for my people. So if I want to step into president's mode or, or, or vice president's mode, don't be afraid of that. And I hope that whoever's watching this, if you think that education may be a, a goal or a pathway for you, do it. No one can stop you. I mean, I just wanted to acknowledge Melcina because I spend a lot of time in schools as well, which reminds me of just what places of power they really are. And when you get teachers showing that kind of leadership, you know, it really calls the question on the failings of your own practice and your own institutions. Because <clears throat> when you look at beautiful, powerful, so talented five and six year olds, you have to wonder what we do to them 
that they don't stay that way when they're 22 or 23. And I think, yeah, we and also puts a timeline on you because we can't wait. <clears throat> Every year is a year that costs those young people um, some of their potential, which robs all of us of it. So I think, you know, that was a beautiful beginning. Um, and then to follow your journey as well into that space of program building, which is really unforgiving female. So I really appreciate that as well. You know, um, I, I, I know that we're going to Q and A's, but like just really thinking about what what does the like what does the education system do to us? Uh, it took me six seven months for me to even like get my ish together after my doctoral program. It literally just slices us as humans as spirits. And if it wasn't for my people, for my family, for my mom's prayers. I, I don't think I would have came with one head. I, y'all would have seen me in like two heads or I would have been dead. And I think that being able to say that with, with you saying with um, Moshina's conversation of us being in grade school and then what they look like in community college, you're like, dang, what did we do to them? Thank you. Thank you all. I think we're gonna just um, get into the Q&A. Our first question is for um, Final Sina. Um, question from Hokulani Aikau. Your work is powerfully inspirational. How did your students respond to the Talano Amana framework when you did this work with them? Um, it was funny because like in research, as we think about it, like you have to like talk to your participants, make them sign a form, you know, all, all these things to make sure that you're not um, hurting them or that you're ethically being correct, right? But when you think about us as Pacifica and we continue to tauhi these relationships, it was actually pretty easy, you know, because then they're like, oh, that's what we gotta do to get our grade? Heck yeah, like, let's go. What do we have to do, you know? All of a sudden they were reading more, they were more engaging um, because I think being able to introduce it in the way that they understood, um, let's be real. There's a lot of conversations in our education system that our PI students don't know how to write that we're not readers, that we're, that, you know, and, and it hurts me. I get kind of defensive and I want to fight people. But also at the same time, <laughs> but also at the same time, I'm realizing like, maybe it's because we're not first letting them write with us, find it with us, you know, maybe it's because we're not looking for this so that I'm able to say, no, Shanae, no, Sheena, no, Karen, this is because you haven't done it this way. So Talano Amana was a way that we did it as a team. Um, from the beginning of the semester, we talked to them and I told them, um, talk to a candidate, this class is also gonna be part of my research. And these are my purposes. I, I laid it out clear. I laid out what they're gonna get. And the benefit that they were gonna get was food. Everyone loves food, but the grade. And I feel like that right there made them like, ding, this makes sense. Like not only am I benefiting social emotionally, culturally, I'm also benefiting in the system where I'm actually becoming the curriculum. And I think that instructors who become um, within their research or practitioners, I would say, practitioners who are teachers should use the curriculum to move it. I hate when people say, oh, I have to get it approved for my dean or whatever. Actually, as a teacher, I realize that teachers actually have the power to do whatever they wanna do, sorry. And if they don't like you, they can, they don't have to pass you. I'm just kidding. <laughs> but like things like that, that I was continuing to unpack as a researcher, as a practitioner, and also as someone who wasn't seen in class. Thanks. Okay, next question. We have one for Melsina. Um, Mahalo Melsina for sharing your work with us today. I appreciate how um, Pacifica languages and knowledges are woven together with research-based pedagogical practices at PHA. Early in your presentation, you said that Hawaii is your host culture. Can you say more about what that means for your school? Yeah, you know, especially here in the United States or international, really globally, when you think of a Pacific Islander, I think the first thing that people think if you're from the US is Hawaii. And so I, um, with that being said, there's a lot of um, hands on with our Hawaiian community to actually walk us through the processes as educated and as smart and as intellectual as we think we are. 
when you come to your new land, you look for a brother or sister that not only looks like you, but sort of speaks like you and understand your way. So you don't have to explain all the time. So being a host or culture host or island host, um, Hawaii has been a very um, essential part of our journey as Pacific Heritage Academy because, you know, with an accent, and they have an accent too, but, you know, they understand where we're coming from. And so with that, I think when you come, and then immigration movement of the Pacific, you know, when you come from the Marshall Islands, the first place you go either to Guam or to Hawaii. And being Hawaii as a state of the United States of America and being part of that whole, it's really nice to have, um, excuse me if you know I sound weird to say this, but a brown brother and sister to walk you through the system. And so, yeah, they are our host, literally and figuratively and metaphorically to guide us through the process or the sometimes complicated process. It's even in education, which is supposed to simplify everything. And so that's why we call them the host culture. If that answers your question, Hoku, I think it does. Melsina, thank you so much for explaining, you know, that a lot of the Pacifica that come, you know, end up, you know, usually going to either Guam or Hawaii first um, before they make their way to Turtle Island. And that's important to recognize that genealogy as well, right? Um, and then moving kind of on to that, I was thinking, I think, Damon, you kind of spoke to this a little bit. Um, and Finalsina, uh, you were talking about like how to Tauhi, you know, relationships, Tauhi Ba relationships and spaces. So I wanted to ask you all, what are the ways in which um, you or the programs or Tauhi um, spaces for our indigenous brothers and sisters whose lands we're currently on? So how are we integrating that type of knowledge um, into our classrooms as well as um, Pacifica or indigenous people? Are there ways that, there are creative ways that we're trying to um, integrate that into our curriculum? Damon, I don't know if you wanna speak a little bit more to start us off with I, that. I, I think um, what we do see in New Zealand, which we're very fortunate is uh, a real political will, particularly amongst teachers to integrate this within um, classroom settings at the compulsory sector. So people actually do come, especially Pacific students come with quite a high familiarity with many of it. It's often not very deep. Um, and we're actually rewriting the, we're refreshing, they call it the national curriculum. But these core values are built into the institutions. So actually one of the challenges is to make sure that their Pacific and self-knowledge catches up with that. So as well as them having a way where they're not seen as competing knowledges that you can, you can understand and learn about Māori and that doesn't foreclose or, or um, prevent you doing the same about your, yourself. So I think that's a very specific New Zealand problem that uh, many of them want to learn Pacific equivalents to Māori concepts that they're familiar with. And of course, there's not one, there's many. And so um, it comes with a challenge of really quite low levels of exposure to Pacific knowledge at, at high school, which is, is a real problem in New Zealand. Thank you. Melsina or Finalsina, did you want to add? Yeah, you know, I appreciate that being said, Damon, because, you know, it's so important when we as, or I am speaking as a Pingla Peace Pone Pan coming to the different spaces that we have and see the similarities. So there's so many similarities within our Pacific Island community than differences. Even though we do butt heads and like the issues going on in Hawaii right now with the Micronesians. And that's not my experience with the Hawaii that I went to school with, you know, back in the early eighties. And, and when people talk about these, um, I wonder why it's happening that way. But what I know is when I look at the just the basics. We have so much similarities that we need to teach those to our kids or our students to actually be proud of. And um, again, know that you know there's so much more history behind our uh, similar languages uh, and the cultures and the traditions and the family uh, connections 
to the land or to the sea. And it's because there's connection in the past that we need to acknowledge and move forward with and be proud of it. I think that's where the identity crisis comes in because you know we're not sure if we should be proud of our names or you know identities or even our looks sometimes you know being the shorter part of the pacific islanders but you know just to uh, reiterate what uh, damon mentioned you know it's so important to know and i'm glad that i i have spaces for my elementary kids to look up to and to you know take the education journey wherever their vaca may take them mahalo Finalcina, you know, did you wanna? Yeah, I think I wanna take it back to what Dr. Uh, Vince Diaz said in the beginning of the panels. Um, and I fully um, stand with that as well, is that um, Pacific studies in order for it to be authentic and genuine and legit, like that's how I say it, legit, is that we have to have an ongoing relationships with indigenous folks within the context of where we are. Um, without that, Without that relationship, Pacific studies will not move because mm -hmm. the spirit will not move because that's not that, that is not what we're founded on, um, and 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 how we do this it's it's a pretty uh, crazy conversation not crazy but like pretty complex conversation because it starts with us understanding who we are, then it, then we're able to reach out into other places. I couldn't really hear what Damon said earlier because that my internet was um, down. So if he said that, I agree with him. Um, and I just want to say that it makes me understand that when you have a relationship with indigenous people within the context of your state, the power of the kele kele, of the land that you are on, will continue to move with you on your fights, to, to, to move with you in your currents. Um, and when you have a relationship with indigenous people of your culture, then you start to understand how we're connected, that connection that we have with indigenous people here in the context of the Bay Area with the Black community, with the Latinx community. Um, and when you continue to think about that, the power that comes from each of those relationships, um, you, you can't help but think about FLE's unifying as one to go against these paradox of hegemony. Thank you. Thank you so much. And I think that um, with that, you know, it's just a great reminder of us to come full circle. You know, we're on Turtle Island, right? Uh, most of us, sorry, Damon, you're on the other island. Um, <laughs> but how, you know, we continue to think about um, our responsibility and how we're being held accountable and for us to move forward um, as Pacifica people, we do need to engage and acknowledge and respectfully um, build community and honor those whose land we reside on. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Maile. Oh. Oh, okay. Hi. Thank you so much to our panelists. This was such a great panel. Um, yeah, just to close up, um, I have a couple um, Thank you, Sishse, and a couple announcements. Um, so uh, let's see. Thank you so much uh, to all of our um, audience members who showed up. Um, thank you to all of our planning committee and event support, including Angela Robinson, Anae Tiolu, Tanji Vey, Mikhail Kimbra, and Hoku Aikau. Thank you as well to Dean Catherine Stockton for her support, as well as our funders, the Mellon Foundation um, and the University of Utah's Global Learning Across the Disciplines grant from the Office of Global Engagement. A recording of this panel and all of the other ones in our series will be posted on our YouTube page um, shortly. Um, and Another, just another few announcements. So at 3 p.m. Um, Mountain Time, which is in less than half an hour, um, we're having our second panel that will focus on issues of health and Pacific Islanders. Um, the Zoom link for that next event is the same, um, but you just might need to sign in again because we're gonna go dark for a bit very shortly to run tech support for the next panel. Um, and you can see our website for more information on that panel. 
Um, and then a couple other announcements. So under the leadership of our moderator, Dr. Keha Van, and as well as the work of Moana Uluave Hafoko, Hafoka, um, there's the Pacifica webinar series, which you should check out on our YouTube page. And the next event for that is on Friday, April 23rd at 6 p.m. Mountain Time. Um, and it'll be a talk by Dr. Tina Delisle at, from the University of Minnesota. You can find more on that series and that talk on our Facebook and Instagram pages. Um, and then the second program um, is the Pacifica Scholars Institute. And this program is really um, relevant to the topic of this panel today. Um, it's a program for anyone who is a Pacific Islander graduating senior or transfer student interested in attending the University of Utah. It's a five-day intensive program aimed at preparing students interested in Pacific Island studies and higher education, culture, and community-based leadership and learning. Um, and this year, it'll be held uh, June 7th to 11th, and applications are due May 28th. Um, and then finally, there's also this cool opportunity um, for any Pacific Islander artists in Utah to please check out the Harvard Oceanic Collections Engagement Fellowship, which is a really cool opportunity offering funding for Pacific Islander artists who live in Utah to work with the Harvard Peabody Museum's Oceanic Collections. So um, yeah, those are my announcements. Thank you again to all our panelists and our audience members. And I think Damon um, had one more thing he wanted to share with us um, as we close out. Thank you. Um, so I just talked uh, Miley into letting me play um, a short film I had made. It's, it's literally 57 seconds long, which was kind of about me trying to um, convince the rest of the university that and show future students the Pacific nature of our university. So I kind of pretend what would our university look like if it was a truly <laughs> Pacific university. So hopefully you can hear this and here we go. Damon, I think we can't hear the sound. Oh, um, sorry. But... <laughs> <laughs> it's Pacific <laughs> sound. So, <laughs> Do... Also, if you have a link to it, we can it's make almost... sure to share it. Yeah, OK, I'll do that. It's almost done anyway. <laughs> OK, it looks very beautiful. Yeah. But okay, I think, yeah, with that, we'll end and um, we'll try to get that link um, to Damon's video out to everybody through the Zoom follow-up. So thank you again, everyone.